So, <laughs> growing up, it was mostly me, my mom, and my brother against the world. Yeah. I think that was on her birthday, too. I don't remember how old she was turning. This one's old. That's my little brother, I think, when he came home from the hospital. That's me and my grandmother. My mother was a single mother, and she, she, raised, she raised me and my, my younger brother. Um, but my, my grandmother was, was around a lot to, to help out, and I, I learned a lot from her. I learned how to beat, I learned how to sew, I learned how to cook. My grandmother is right here, and that's my great-grandmother. And then these are all of her siblings. Growing up on the reserve, it's like growing up with a giant family which is really, really cool because, yes, you live in your home with your, your family, your, your mother, your father, your siblings, but then when you go out, you also have 10,000 different uncles and 10,000 different aunts and 10,000 different cousins. Um, we're a giant family out here, and we just watch out for each other. I think I have one in here, like my first powwow dress. This is my, my first powwow dress that I ever had. When me and my brother we were kids, we did a lot of water activities around the house. Drinking from our water hose or using it for like water balloons. I grew up around water. Like we did everything around the water. But unfortunately, what we didn't understand with that water that we were directly consuming from the hose um, was it was contaminated by uranium. When I was about 14 years old, my whole family, we got very, very, very sick. I remember being completely paralyzed in, in my bed and I, I couldn't move an inch. My, my joints and my bones were so sore. Um, and then my brother, when he got it, he, his heart inflamed and he had rashes all over his body. Um, and then he was hospitalized for about a week and a half. And even the doctors, like they didn't know what he had at all. So they just kept him under surveillance to make sure that nothing was gonna change and he wouldn't get even more sick. When I grew up, I realized after testing the water in my home that what had happened to my family was chlorine toxicity. Growing up, my community was on the well system, which was contaminated with uranium. When I was about 14, approximately 53% of the community was placed on water infrastructure. The reason why these types of infrastructure systems cause so many issues instead of actually helping is because within the government of Canada, they run by what's called the tendering policy, which enables them to create contracts with the cheapest contractor available. The reason why the cheapest option is not actually working is because they're just constantly using chlorine. When we're looking at boil water advisories across Canada and we see that the government of Canada is lifting them, it's not because they're actually fixing the problem, it's because they're just telling the water operators to add more chlorine. But the issue with adding more chlorine is you get more and more cases of chlorine toxicity and more and more cases of anemia because adding more chlorine to the water actually demineralizes the water. We were all poisoned by the treatment plant that was installed by the government of Canada that was supposed to help us. That realization, that understanding of what had actually happened to me and my family was what really propelled me into to the work that I do now. This is a picture of my brother and my great-grandmother when she started getting sick with cancer. Before my, my grandmother passed away, we did a lot of family gatherings. Um, I grew up in a family of musicians, so we were always um, playing guitar and singing. So it's super easy to go and find out on the Government of Canada website the statistics for boil water advisories and water advisories. 
However, what they don't tell you is that there's this huge loophole in those statistics. On the website, they'll only put the boil water advisory statistic. My community is on a do not consume, so we do not fit within that statistic at all because you cannot boil uranium out of the water. So it's easier for them to hide those numbers from the public because as soon as the public sees that number, a lot of things are gonna change because it's, it's ridiculous. In one of the countries with the most fresh water in the world, why is this still an issue? Right, because if you looked at Toronto, Ottawa, or Montreal, and something happened to the water infrastructure overnight, it'd be fixed within 24 hours. But when you look at First Nations communities, like mine, we've had this issue since we've had well water. So we're going on, what, 25 years of a do not consume? But it's not public because it's not a boil water advisory. I didn't understand that as a kid. I mean, I had tap water coming out of the tap, but it was contaminated with uranium. You just can't see it, and you can't understand that it's a problem until you're much older when you get cancer. Like my grandmother had cancer, and my great-grandmother had cancer. My, my mother is being tested for cancer, and I'm probably gonna get cancer in my lifetime because we consumed that water. I decided to go into more of like the policy side of things to really understand these loopholes and these policies that ensure that First Nations people are kept on the ground. When it comes to infrastructure, First Nations communities, they're not the decision makers any step of the way. So I help run an organization called NIBI, which is a student-led social enterprise that empowers Indigenous youth and promotes access to safe drinking water. With Hopedale Labrador, we realized that there was a huge problem with their water because they kept going on boil water advisory every single year. But in order to get them off of boil water advisory, there was just more chlorine added to the water. So when we got our water tests back from the community, we found out that their water was over chlorinated and that there was no minerals at all in the water, which was causing the community members to become sick with anemia. So that's when we decided uh, that our solution was going to be entry point access filtration systems. So right where the water enters the home, there's a filter right there. With the remineralization process, it's like a fail-safe solution because eventually they will go back on boiled water advisory and then the water's gonna be even more chlorinated and they're still gonna be stuck with the same issues. So we're trying to ensure that no matter what happens at the treatment plant, the people that are consuming the water um, out of this filter are completely protected. The issue that we also ran into was that the government of Canada is not funding these types of projects in First Nations communities unless they're complete treatment plants. So in order to generate the funds for, for Hope de Labrador, with the help of St. George Elementary, we were able to raise approximately $7,500. The kids were 10, 10, 10 years old. The fact that it's kids stepping up to find the funds for projects like this where the government is not, I think it shows a lot about our, our own government and where the issues are at. I am trying to bring another pilot project into my home community because we do have the solution to fix the problem. And being able to fix the uranium issue in my community without my community paying out of pocket and ensuring that when the kids in my community grow up, they'll never have to wonder if they'll have cancer. I think that that, that is my, my end goal.